Chapter 2 Clock Workshop The old man led them through dim and quiet streets to an area of the town comprised mostly of storage houses with small shuttered windows and warehouses with high double doors, black studs driven in for strength and chains shut. No one was abroad at that hour save a thin striped cat that skulked in the darkest of shadows and watched them with yellow-eyed suspicion. The old man paused in front of a door that had a curious iron band across its waist, with three stubby levers sticking out from slits in the band. He turned back to the thief and tapped a twisted finger on the door. I imagine you're the sort who understand very well how a lock works. The tumblers and the levers, that sort of thing. The thief nodded in dumb assent. Well then, the old man pushed and pulled on the levers, easily manipulating them with the palms of his ravaged hands. I couldn't manage to use a key anymore, so I made myself into one. The thief opened his mouth to speak, then closed it as the old man spun around and poked an accusing claw at him. And think you can just memorise my combination? Bah! I doubt you have the mathematics for that. Every time I lock or unlock my door, a wheel randomises certain elements. To get in or out, I have to solve the equation. Archimedes would have loved it, I think. Pretty clever, huh? The thief pursed his lips as he considered this. What if you're stuck inside and there's a fire? The old man scowled. So you finally speak and you think you're a wit. Come on in then. This cold gets into my bones. The old man shuffled inside and pushed on another lever, which clicked and, with a whoosh, a network of oil lamps suspended from the ceiling by chains, burst into flame and illuminated the room. The interior of the building was one huge space, but almost filled to the roof with convoluted and baffling machinery. Sawtooth wheels rotated slowly against each other on wooden axles, pulleys spung up and down on paths proscribed by intermeshed brass gears, pipes twisted and turned and terminated in valves with round iron handles screwed into them. A sudden gout of steam erupted from an opening in the floor, covered with a metal grate. The machinery groaned and squeaked, and at intervals the steam valves would peep a short whistle, then fall silent. The thief studied the scene, looking for traps or hidden weapons. The salt, earthy tang of grease lay heavy in the air. Close the door then, and welcome to my workshop. Come on in, if you're not scared of a few puffs of smoke. Are you a magician, old man? I've seen conjuring tricks and miracle herbs, but nothing like this. Magic? There's no magic, lad, except, well, everything, I suppose. Everything? Isn't the world a magical place? Strange forces, alchemy, metalwork? Navigation? Did you ever ask how a compass works or why the wind rises and falls? The thief shrugged with a non committal wrinkle on his cheek. I don't worry about why the world is the way it is. I seem to have enough difficulty keeping my head attached to my body. That path is for dreamers or poets or madmen. The old man's nostrils flared as he glared at the thief. Madman? No, boy. Tis all science. 
Only the mystery of the unknown itself is magic. And once you master it, you are left with science. What good is that? Here, come with me and I'll show you. He led the thief, whose head twitched towards every clank and whistle of the great machinery, deeper into the workshop. At the centre of the room, there was a great workbench, as wide as a feasting table. Fixed on it were clamps and presses, and tools lay scattered about, saws and hammers and tongs. Who works here, old man? You? How can you with your... Uh... He pointed at the old man's twisted hands. Be quiet now and watch. The old man clambered into a tall chair, bound with straps and clamps, and looking very much like a torturer's chair of interrogation. The thief shivered with an unbidden recollection. The old man forced down iron clasps with the heels of his palms, locking himself in place. He reached forward and the edge of his mouth twitched as he pushed his hands with difficulty into large brass gauntlets that lay resting on the arms of the chair. The old man stepped on a foot lever and the machinery groaned and more steam spewed from behind the chair. The thief stepped back and reached for his blade reflexively. With a louder groan and the grinding of metal against metal, the old man stood up, grinning toothily. He was armoured in a brass and iron skeleton, animated by gears and shafts that ran back into the chair behind him. He beckoned the thief with an articulated brass finger, longer than the thief's knife. These are my hands now. Each of my slightest movements can be magnified tenfold. He reached out to the table and picked up a pair of iron tongs held them out to the thief for inspection. Then, without any sign of effort, he bent the tongs back on themselves and handed the twisted metal to the thief. The thief tugged and strained against the tongs, but couldn't straighten the cast iron. Impressive. You are a war machine of some kind. Never! The old man roared, speckled the thief with spittle, and then closed his eyes and took a deep breath. That was the highest gear setting and merely an experiment I amused myself with. Now watch, this is what the equipment was built to do. He settled back into the chair, to the grunching of gears, turning and hissing of steam. His gauntlets guided a metal cap onto his head and pulled down a pair of glass cap tubes that were articulated into grooves that ran from the back to the front of his cap. He leaned forward and hunched over his workbench, his gauntlets cupping and working something with his brass vision tubes descending between them. After much mumbling, cursing, he sighed and sat back up then held out one gauntlet to the thief. The thief stooped to examine what the old man had in the palm of his hand. It was a tiny brass bee, vibrating and twitching, but with a regular buzzing, ticking monotone that was unlike that of a live insect. The thief stepped back, his jaw flapping open, and the old man laughed as he tossed the bee into the air. It flew. You are a sorcerer. The bee spiralled around the room, with the thief spinning around beneath it, at its coming and going, rising and falling. Then it returned to the palm of the old man, and the buzzing trailed off until it was silent and still. The old man slid back the brass vision tubes, squeaking as they retracted from his face. The cheeks were creased and his dark eyes twinkled in the lamplight. Not a sorcerer, lad, just a toy maker. 
I made curiosities and toys to amuse the old sultan, rest his soul. It is only as magical as you want to believe it is. The thief stared in silence at the lifeless bee in the old man's hand. At length, the old man gently dropped the bee onto the workbench and began the noisy and complicated business of unstrapping himself from the mechanical chair. Let's find that wine, I promised. You look like you need a drink to settle you down. This way. Other mechanical creations were scattered around the room. Articulated joints and knotted hoses and all manner of failed and abandoned experiments lay in piles against the walls. They passed by a model of a dragon with painted paper wings, each the height of a man, stretched across a fan of finely jointed wooden spars. The thief drew out a wing, feather light, yet rigid as steel. What is this? A toy for children, like a kite, but more powerful. He grinned at the thief. I take it out on a rope on windy days, and the children beg to fly it. I tell them to grasp onto the harness there. See it? Then when the wind gusts, it lifts them into the air. I should hear them squeal. How big are these kids? The thief stroked his chin as he examined the giant kite. The old man did not respond and carried on past the last of the machinery. At the back of the workshop was a small living area, a fireplace and some cabinets, a bed and an iron-bound chest secured with a large padlock at the foot of it. The rugs had once been fine and detailed, but now were faded and worn with age, their edges ragged and the threads frayed. The old man muttered to himself as he searched inside the cabinets, then emerged with a bulbous glass bottle stoppered with red wax. He handed it to the thief and raised up his hands. You can see why this bottle has lain dusty. Open it, would you? He shuffled away, and after more muttering in the cabinets, began to lay out some cedarwood drinking bowls, a large flat bread and a plate of dried strips of meat. Eat up, lad. My thanks for your noble assistance. The thief's attention was fixed on the plate of meat as he poured his host and himself a generous serving of wine. Then, with a nod of thanks, he ripped into the meat and tore off a piece of bread which he held expectantly near his mouth as he chewed the dried strips. What's your name, lad? I'm Vashir, once toy maker to the Sultan, now considered a crackpot with delusions of grandeur. The thief swallowed the meat and rinsed it down with a draught from his wine bowl. I'm used to travelling under many names, if you understand my circumstances. You probably wouldn't be able to pronounce my birth name. The language would be strange to you, but for the last few months I've answered to Manu. Well, Manu it is. What brings you to Ur? This is very fine work, wine, Vashir. You didn't answer my question, Manu. The thief smiled and took a sip of the wine. Tell me more about working for the old sultan. Did you injure your hands there? Vashir cupped the wine bowl between his palms. It was after the old sultan died. He was a reasonable master and loved his toys. I even made toys for his son, Mithridates. Such a simple boy then. But when his father died and he took the throne, things changed. His curled fingers twitched around the bowl. It is foolish to dwell on the past. In any event, we'll have our own troubles to handle soon enough. Between the stirring up of the working classes by such cruel oppression and winning no friends at Nineveh, a storm is coming. A storm that could sweep us all away. There are problems with Nineveh? I thought Ur was at peace now. That's why I came here. 
For now, yes, but it's a fragile peace. Nineveh warred for years against the Sultan's father, Ardashir, but when he died unexpectedly, they offered a chance to the new Sultan to sue for peace, and he did. For the last three years, we've had no conflicts, and it has cemented the new Sultan's position. But as he grows comfortable, he's spoken publicly of the superiority of Ur over Nineveh and has spurned their ambassador many times. Travellers from Nineveh say that even now the more fiery among their youthful nobility plead for a chance to lead troops against us and to teach Mithridates some manners. The old man hunched over their meal and toyed with a piece of bread before tossing it down and sitting back with a sigh. Pour out the rest of that wine and eat your fill as well. I'm tired and ready for my bed. Sleep on the rugs here if you wish tonight. I've no desire to turn you out onto the cold. He struggled to his feet and pulled a sash cord that caused the array of oil lamps to extinguish with a fizz and a whiff of smoke. The thief sat alone in the checkered moonlight cast through small windows high in the walls of the odd building. 